You're listening to a message preached from the pulpit of the Bible Baptist Church, St. Thomas, Ontario. 2 Peter chapter 1. Glad you're here tonight. Hope the Lord will give you something from the Word of God tonight that will be a blessing and encouragement to you. How many of you like baseball? Anybody like baseball? Even some of our seniors like baseball. All right, good. All right. Um, How many of you are Blue Jays fans? Any Blue Jays fans? All right. I'm an Indians fan first and a Blue Jays fan second, all right, by birth and then by choice, all right? So um, baseball, it can be a long game. It's not uh, so exciting sometimes, you know, inning after inning after inning. But there is a very exciting play in baseball. I think the most exciting play in baseball has got to be uh, the home run. I mean, when someone just cranks it out of the park and and you uh, see that, the excitement in the stadium, and uh, I've seen many home runs in my time. I've seen home runs that have uh, just barely made the seats, just barely cleared the fence, and it still counts as a home run. I've seen home runs hit off the top of the fence and bounce over, and that still counts as a home run. I've seen times where a, a player went back and it hit off his glove in play, and it bounced out of his glove over the fence, and it still counts as a home run. As long as that ball goes over the fence before it hits the ground, it counts as a home run. And whether it goes just barely over or sneaks over or pops over, it doesn't matter, it still counts as a home run. But there's another type of home run. Um, in fact, I, I Google it this week, and the term, if you Google this term uh, on your computer, it'll come up with videos of home runs, and the definition is of a home run, and that is a no-doubter. They call it a no-doubter. When someone hits the ball so hard, so, so high, that it is, without a shadow of a doubt, it's, I mean, a hurricane force wind could not keep that in the park. And the, the guy just kind of stands there and admires the ball go out. He knows as soon as he connects with that, that ball is out. It's called a no-doubter. And when I thought about that, I thought back a couple years, and some of you will know this, to 2015, when Jose Pautista hit a home run against the Texas Rangers. And it's a famous uh, play, and he hit it out of the park. He stood there, and he watched it go out of the park. Uh, The crowd went crazy. I think Nate was actually there at that game, and the crowd went crazy. I've seen Nate's video many times of of his, as everybody piled on top of him in the stands, and the crowd was going crazy. And Bautista stood there and watched it for a little bit, and then he did what they call the bat flip. And he just took that bat, and he just flung it in the air like that, and it did (laughs) his little trot. I mean, just so confident, so cocky, which, as a Blue Jays fan, you love. As a Texas Rangers fan, not so much, right? And in fact, the, uh, just a few minutes after that, I just watched the video again today in preparation for the service today, and uh, the bench is cleared shortly after that. I mean, the, the Texas Rangers did not like the fact that Bautista hit a no-doubter and watched it and go out and just, and just admired that, that confidence that he had uh, at that home run. It's called a no-doubter. You say, well, Pastor Al, what, what does this got to do with the Bible and First Peter? Well, I hope by the time that we're done, you'll see what it has to do. We're going to talk about the process of the Christian, the process of the Christian tonight. And uh, if I had to subtitle this message, I would call it this, how to be a no-doubter Christian. How to be that no, there's no doubt in your mind or anybody else's mind that you are a child of God and it is evident and obvious to everyone. First Peter, uh, sorry, Second Peter chapter one tells us about this Christian life that we can experience. All right. And so by the end, we'll tie it all together and bring it back that no doubter Christian. So um, we've been doing our doctrinal study pastor has covered the person. He talked about your personal salvation, your personal security last week, and your personal submission or baptism. So he talked about those things, the, uh, the person of our doctrine. And now we're going to move on to the, uh, the process. And so pastor asked me to cover this while he was out of town tonight, the process of the Christian. And we're going to talk about that here in uh, 2 Peter. I, my goal tonight is obviously to teach you some doctrine, but also my goal is exactly the same goal that Peter had in writing this passage of scripture. That's probably a good idea that my goal is the same as his goal. And so I'm going to show you he spells out in this passage what he's trying to accomplish. And so I'm not going to try to trick you. I'm going to try to tell you ahead of time what I would hope to happen in the next 30 minutes together uh, in this time. As we leave this room, what would happen to us over the next 30 minutes? This is our goal. This is our idea. And so I hope you'll see this here as we look at the process of the Christian. Look at 2 Peter chapter 1. And we'll look at the end of the passage we're going to look at first to see our purpose, and we'll go back and work our way forward. Chapter 1, verse number 12. 
Wherefore, I will not be negligent. That means careless. I'm not going to be careless about this thing. This is important. I'm not going to be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though ye know them and be established in the present truth. He said, I'm going to, I've been doing, I'm telling you some things. I know you already know these things and I, I'm not going to be careless about this. I'm going to do it again and again and again. And so I'm going to remind you of some things that you know and you're established in. So he said, these are not brand new truths that are going to just blow your mind. These are just established truths in your heart. But he said, I, I don't care. I'm going to remind you about it over and over and over again. Later on, he says, I'm going to keep doing this till the day I die. So if you don't like it now, you're not going to like it later on. I'm just going to keep doing it while I'm in this tabernacle. I'm going to remind you of these things that you already know and are established in. Why is he going to do this? Verse number 13. Yeah, I think it meet as long as I'm in this tabernacle, as long as I'm alive. And here it is to stir you up by putting you in remembrance. He said, my goal is to just remind you of some things you already know so that you'll get stirred up. I want, you to be, I, I want you to leave tonight, and we want you to leave our doctrinal study stirred up to action. The word stirred up there means to awake fully, to arouse, to, to, be, uh, to wake up. I know sometimes even in a, a church service, after you know, halfway through the service, we kind of get uh, in that routine, and we just need a, a wake-up call, right? And, and Paul saying, or Peter saying here, I want to stir you up. I want to motivate you to action by reminding you of some things you already know. And you're already established in. And so the stuff we hear tonight will not be brand new for you. And maybe it is. Maybe you're newly saved or, you know, new to the things of the Lord. This will be some of the stuff will be new. But for those who've been established in the things of the Lord, this is the process of the Christian. We understand that. But it ought to, the remembering of it ought to stir us up. And so that's what we're looking at tonight. The idea of trying to be woken up, fully aroused to action as we look at these things from first uh, from second Peter. Let's have a word of prayer and I'll give you just a brief message here from the word of God. Heavenly Father, we are delighted to be here tonight and we're thankful for all that you have done for us already. We're thankful for the music, the congregational singing and for the specials that we've heard and how they've honored you and glorified you. And we're thankful for those who prepared those for us and for the piano and uh, all the instrumentals that, that uh, participate. Thank you for everybody who has come and put time into this service. And Father, now I pray that you would help us to draw near to you in the next few minutes that we might understand what you have for us, that we would leave here understanding more fully our doctrine, but uh, that we would take that and put that into practical application in our life this week, that this week our, our life would be different because of what we learn and see in your word tonight. And that's what we ask. We ask that your Holy Spirit would move among us, teach us, point out things in our lives that we need, each of us individually. In your precious name we pray. Amen. All right, here we go. We'll start back at verse number one. We're going to work our way back toward uh, verses 12 and 13. We'll start in verse number one. The Bible says, Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. That's a key phrase. Through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these things ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. We're going to look at, first of all here, if you have an outline there, you're keeping notes, the beginning of the Christian life. Here he talks about uh, how we are saved. And the beginning of the Christian life begins at salvation. It begins in verse number one with a precious faith. And it tells us that we have this precious faith. So Peter's talking to believers here. He's talking to people who know Christ, who have a precious faith and have experienced the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And so it begins with this precious faith where we trust in Jesus Christ alone for salvation. That's our doctrine. It is by, not by works, not by church membership, not by baptism. It is by faith in a, alone in Jesus Christ. And that's that precious faith that we have in his righteousness that saves us. And Jesus Christ becomes our savior. That's verse number one there. Verse number two kind of has that, the general greeting that we have in a lot of the letters written by the apostles. And then in verse three, it, it picks it up and says that we have according as his divine power. 
Salvation happens by a divine power. When God works on us and in us and we get saved, it, it, is, it is us trusting him and, and then God doing that supernatural work to, to save us to, and to change us from a sinful person to a, a, a sin, still a sinner, just saved by grace and justified, just like we've never sinned before. And so that power of God is evident. And then it goes on to say in verse number four, it talks about his divine nature. We're partakers of the divine nature, a new nature, a different nature, something that is totally against us. Now, we understand what it means by nature. Some of you by nature are um, outgoing people. How many would say by nature you're kind of an outgoing person? Would you raise your hand? All right, good. Put your hands down. That's great. How many would you say by nature you're more um, reserved? You're a more reserved person by nature. All right, good. Some of you are so reserved that you didn't raise your hand either time. You're, you're in the third category that you are so reserved. You don't want any, how many is that? You, you'd raise your hand now. Anybody, okay, there, there's a couple. Okay, say that, that's me. I'm so reserved. I don't want to raise my hand the first two times. All right? So you know what it means to be something by nature, right? It's so funny. If you usually watch people who raise their hand. How many are outgoing by nature? You raise your hand differently. They're like, they're like right there, and they're like, you know, it's just how you're different, how you raise your hand. That's by nature. You are. And we all are. We have different things by nature. We are. We understand what it is to be by nature. Let me tell you something about your nature. <laughs> Whether you're outvert, uh, extroverted or introverted doesn't matter. By nature, you're a sinner. By nature, you have your own way. You want your own way. Some of you are more stubborn than others. You're all stubborn. I'm stubborn. We're all stubborn. We, the Bible says it this way. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one of us to our own way, to his own way. We have our own, I have my way of doing things. And so I have an old nature. It is a sinful nature. And so by nature, I am a sinner. And by choice, I am a sinner. That's the old nature. But the day we get saved, we get a new nature. We get the divine nature. We get the Holy Spirit of God inside of us. And that is a that that's a that is a changing point in your life where you go from just a sinner. Now you're you're almost a split personality. You have an old nature, but now you have a new nature. And so this is doctrinal. This is how salvation happens when the new nature moves in. Now the battle is on. Is it going to be your way? All we like sheep have gone astray and turned everyone to his own way. Or is it going to be the Lord's will? Your way or his will are always at battle. This is how it is. And so but if we have this divine nature. And then I love this phrase in verse 3. According as his divine power hath given unto us. Now listen to this. All things that pertain unto life and godliness. Know what that means? God's given you everything you need. God has made it possible for you to live above the old nature and live in the new nature. You, you can be a victorious Christian. It's possible. You have what you need to succeed. All things to pertain. I don't care what your background is or if you were raised in church or not in church. When you get saved, you get the divine nature. And now you have all things that pertain to life and godliness. You can live a godly life. We can make excuses all we want. But God says you got it. You got everything you're going to get and everything you need. You have all things in my nature. You have all things that pertain to life and godliness. Do we struggle with sin? Sure. But you can have victory because God's given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. I have in your notes here just to kind of sub this point up here. Spiritual success is anticipated and attainable. Anticipated and attainable. That's what God wants you to. It, God expects us to move on and be successful in our Christian walk. This is how things are supposed to go. You're supposed to get saved and have spiritual success. He's given you everything you need to succeed. So all those things are there. This is supposed to be the norm, not the exception. We talk about when someone who gets saved and, seven, you know, and after a while they kind of fall away. That should be the exception, not the norm. The normal part should be that we are get saved, divine nature. We have all things that pertain to life and godliness, and we move on and we grow and we mature. That's what God says. It's anticipated. That's what God wants. And it's attainable. It can be done. And so that's the beginning of the Christian life. It, all, it starts at the same place for all of us. We're all sinners, and it starts with that precious faith in Jesus Christ. And it points to where it is in verse number one. It's the righteousness of God. It has nothing to do with your righteousness has to do everything with his righteousness. And so in his righteousness, 
we are saved. And that's how, that's how the Christian life begins. So the process of the Christian begins at simple salvation. Again, again that's, that's nothing new to you, uh, but I think we'll see how that builds here in our message. It leads us to the next section, verse 5. Let's read that together. The Bible says this, And besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. So I say not only the beginning of the Christian life is the first section, but the second section we see here is the building of the Christian life. All right, so you, you get saved, you get the divine nature, you have all things that pertain to life and God. Now what? Well, it's the building of the Christian life. It, we go on from that. That's, not, that's just the beginning. We move on. This is the process of the Christian. And it says this, verse number five, and besides this, giving all diligence. The word diligence there means to uh, get at the work with speed and eagerness. I mean, to get at it. I mean, to roll your sleeves up and say, oh, hey, there's work to do. Let's get at it. To be eager to get to work. <laughs> most of us, you know, tomorrow's Monday morning. Most of us will not be eager to get to work tomorrow morning. But that's what God says about the Christian life. To get, you're saved now. And you're like, okay, now what's next? What's, I'm, I got my sins are taken care of. I don't have to worry about uh, my heaven. My eternal destiny is taken care of. Now what? Like uh, Brother Yomo's mission about the Apostle Paul this morning. When he got saved, what was his first thing? He said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Okay, what, what, what's next? With, and with all eagerness and speed, he got busy for God, and he got busy doing things. And here the Bible is saying, with all diligence, with all speed, with all eagerness. That word in the Greek language is very emphatic. He's like saying, this, this is how it ought to be. And so with all, everything you got, get busy doing this. Get busy working out your own salvation, not working on your own salvation, but here's the next step, building the Christian life, all right? So it says this, uh, with all diligence, add. Add to your faith. The word add for us is a very simple word. Here, it's, a, it's an interesting word in the, in the Greek language. Uh, the, the word is a bigger word than our little word add. It uh, means to fully supply. It means to minister. The root word is strange when I looked it up. It is the same root word that we would get our English word choreographer from. I know that sounds strange, but think of it this way. All right, so a choreographer is someone who puts together a, a dance step. And that's what it was back in the Greek days. They, they would have dance, like we're talking about, thinking about dance, but dance is in like a group of people that would uh, lock hand in hand and they would do like a, those ceremonial type of dance that you'd think about now going way back. And so there was a, one man would minister or serve that group by leading them and making sure everybody was in step and those, those steps were followed and everybody was in unison. That was the choreographer. That was the servant who was trying to uh, get those people to join hand in hand and work together in unison. He would minister by making sure everybody was in step with each other. And so he says here, give all eagerness, all diligence to add. And so what we see next are steps. If you imagine like dance steps, here, here's some steps that go hand in hand with each other. And what we have here in the next few uh, words are a beautiful choreography of what the Christian life ought to be. These are the, this is what ought to, the, the beauty of the Christian life are seen in these qualities, all right? And these are not like, it says add your faith virtue to virtue knowledge. And so it's not like you say, okay, now I got faith and then I'll add a virtue. And once I have virtue, then I'll add knowledge. And once I have knowledge, no, it's not like that at all. It's all one big you work on them all at one time. And it's, it's a, it's a, you look at the, the dance as a complete thing, not individual steps. And so this is the idea of this choreographer is that we are to add all these steps at one time as they're all linked together to make this beautiful Christian life that we're building. All right, so it goes on. Add to your faith. Well, here's your, you have your precious faith, right? We already talked about it. You have precious faith. So now add to your faith virtue. Virtue. And I'm not going to take time to go through all these words because that's going to be your homework. If you want to do your homework, you can do that. But uh, it takes too much time. But I do want to talk about virtue for a little bit because in the verse number three, when talking about our salvation, look at verse number three again. According as divine power hath given unto us all things pertaining to life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us, God's called us to glory and virtue. 
What does the word virtue mean? When we think about virtue, we think about uh, a virtuous woman. Pure. But you know what this word virtue means? And I love this word. It means the courage to be excellent. That's a great word. The, uh, to have the courage to stand up and do what's right and excel and be better than everybody, be, be better than you were and take the next step. Not comparing to everybody, to everybody else, but just better. I'm have the courage to do what's right no matter what anybody else thinks. That's virtue. It, it's, a, it's a courageous word. Uh, we think about a vir- virtuous woman. The word virtue is a very manly word. It's a very, it's a very uh, you're not going to, you're not going to influence me. I'm a child of God. And I have the precious faith. He's given me everything I need to succeed. So I'm going to go out and I'm going to do it. And I have the courage to excel and be the best I can be for Jesus Christ. That's the word. Boy, that's a great word. And the Bible here says, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge temperance, and so on and so on. So these here are the building blocks of the Christian life. And so things that we're going to study on our own, and I wish I had time to go through all those. We could probably preach a message on each one of those, but we're not going to take time with that right now. But let me just kind of sum this up here on your outline for you. The bottom line is this. As we build the Christian life, we ought to be eager to increase. We ought to be eager to increase. That's what the word, the word diligence means To be eager to add to your Christian life. Where you are right now in your Christian life should not be enough for you. You ought to want to be more like Jesus Christ. That's what it's saying. And and I'm talking to people who have been saved for a year or 10 years or 20 years or 30 years. I'm talking to uh, young adults to senior adults. It doesn't matter. If you're satisfied where you are, Peter's saying this. I'm going to remind you of these things because I want to stir you up. I don't, you ought not be satisfied with you are, where you are. You ought to be eager to add to your Christian life these characters. If you think you have virtue, you ought to strive to be, have more virtue and knowledge and temperance and patience and godliness and all those things. You add, you add, you add. It is a eagerness to increase. Now, of course, I'm talking to the church on Sunday night. So Sunday night is usually the core group. And, I, and I'm glad that you're on, on Sunday night. But often we come to church, and I want you to think about this. Often we come to church because it's expected. It's expected. In my house, we went to church. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. I grew up that way. It was expected. It was never a discussion. I never thought about not going. <laughs> it just never entered my mind. We went to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. I'm glad for that. I'm glad I grew up that way, and I'm glad I had parents that taught me that. And many of you have been the same way. You've been in church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night for many, many, many years, and it's just kind of expected. And in fact, if you serve in our church, I'm telling you, it is expected. If you want to serve in the ministry of our church, we expect you to come. We don't want you to just show up on Wednesday night, do your service, and not come to church the next Sunday morning. It's expected. You should be here to grow and to learn and to mature. You ought to, there's, a, there's an expectation. Maybe you come because your parents expect you. Maybe it becomes your, your relatives are there. Or someone is looking, and you just kind of just, it's just kind of that routine, and it's expected. Some come to church because it's expected. Others come to church because they're expecting I'm coming. Are you coming to church because you're supposed to be here or are you coming to church because you want something? You want to grow. I want to get something tonight. I'm here expecting God to speak to me. I'm here expecting to learn God's word. I'm expecting to be stirred up. If I'm not stirred up, I'm disappointed. And if I didn't get something from the word of God that night, I'm disappointed. I'm here not because they expect me to be there. I'm here because I'm expecting to get something. Some of you are here because you, you think God expects me to be here. And I think he does. I'm not saying he doesn't. But if that's your only reason for coming to church, there's another level. And it gets so much more exciting when you start coming to church because you're expecting than just because you are expected to be there. And so here is this, way, it's this attitude that you ought to have, this eagerness to increase is what the, the building of the Christian life is all about, this desire. And I've said many times to our teenagers, you know, being spiritual is not about your position, it's about your direction. Are you growing closer and closer to God? That's spirituality. And if you get saved and it takes you a while to get to a certain, and we judge people, you know, based upon outward things. Sometimes we judge them on their Christian growth. But what direction are you going? 
it, you can be saved for a long time, and if you're not progressing, that's not a spiritual person. It's about growth. It's about the eagerness to increase in that Christian walk. And so that is the building of the Christian life. And here's the part I really want to get to. The last section I've entitled The Benefits of the Christian Life. If you will accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, get that divine nature, realize you've got everything you need to succeed, and you say, oh, I'm going I'm to jump into this thing, I'm going to roll my sleeves up and get eager to work in building this Christian life, I'm going to start adding to my faith virtue, to virtue, knowledge, knowledge, temperance, and godliness, and patience, and brilliance. I'm going to start, I'm, I'm in on this, and I want to grow, and I want to learn, and I want to be closer to Christ, and I want to be more like Jesus Christ, and I'm going to roll my sleeves up, and I'm going to live my whole life living this kind of spiritual growth, and this, this kind of a, this desire to be more like Christ, well, what, what, what good is it? Well, I'm going to tell you. The Bible lays out so clearly for us what the benefits are. Look at verse number 8, this last section here. For if these things, which things? Well, I would, if you go back, these things are referring to faith, virtue, knowledge, temperance, those things. If these things be in you and abound... They make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. If these things, these characteristics just mentioned, are in you. Now listen. It says they're in you. It's internal. This growth is not necessarily out. Word, it's inward, and as you grow inward, it shows itself outward. See, these, these characteristics are more things that we strive to be, not things we strive to do. It's not about you know doing courageous, it's about being courageous. It's not a, it's, it's what you strive to be, it, your character with the divine nature inside of you, your character now, by nature, you were a sinner, and now you have the divine nature, and now the divine nature starts to overtake that sin nature step by step by step, and you become more like Jesus Christ and more like God. And these things are in you, and these things be in you and abound. That word abound means to be on the increase. They're, they're growing, they're taking over, and they're, they're more and more of your life is given over to Jesus Christ and obedience to him. If these things be in you and abound, ye shall be neither barren nor unfruitful. The first benefit of the Christian life is fruitfulness. Fruitfulness. You'll not be barren nor unfruitful. And so as you work on these characteristics inward, there is an outward. Fruitfulness means outward. It's obvious. There is an obvious change. This is the way it ought to be. This brings us to a, a doctrinal point here. There are many ideas of what the term Christian means. And when I talked to pastor about this, he wanted me to make sure that we, we kind of talked about this. Today, the word Christian can be used so many ways. We live in a Christian nation, if some would say. All right? In fact, not too long ago, someone asked me, uh, are Catholics Christian? They asked me that question. How would you answer that question? Well, you've got to define your terms. Are Catholics Christians? If you use the word Christian to mean anybody who believes that in Jesus Christ, that there was a Jesus Christ and he was the Son of God, then Catholics are Christians. They believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. They would believe that. They would say, yes, I believe that. I'm a Christian. And so that's what you define Christian as, that's, that's fine, then there do be Christians. We define a Christian as someone who not only believes that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, but receives Jesus Christ as the Son of God in a very personal way, making a life-changing decision to accept Christ. So we would define Christian, probably in the strictest terminology of someone who has trusted Jesus Christ, uh, who believes in Jesus Christ, accepts him as Savior, and there has been a difference, a marked difference in their life. I can't tell you who's saved and who's not, but we can certainly watch people's life and say they act like Jesus or they don't act like Jesus. That's a little easier. That's the fruitfulness of a person who says, I am going to have precious faith in Jesus Christ and I'm going to work on these characteristics and qualities in my life so that it shows itself. You will be fruitful in your life if you work on these things. That's what the Bible is saying here. So the first benefit of just taking, roll up your sleeves, getting busy, and trying to work on these qualities in your life is fruitfulness. Look at the next verse. 
But he that lacketh these things, if you lack, if you don't work on these things in your life and they don't become part of your life, he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. That's an interesting verse. And here's another doctrinal point for us to think about. Last week, Pastor Stone covered eternal security. Once you are saved, once you enter the family of God, you stay in the family of God. It is God that saved you and it's God that keeps you saved. We believe that 100%. Once saved, you're always saved. That's what we believe and we believe the Bible teaches. That's eternal security. The other, and that is a fact. Right? That's a fact. You're saved. You're God's child. It's not going to change. But there's the other side of that is the assurance of salvation. That's more the feeling that you're close to God and that you feel like you're saved. Just because you feel like you're not saved doesn't mean you're not saved. The fact is, if you trusted Jesus Christ, your Savior, you made him, then you're saved. But there are times in a, in a Christian's life when they may not feel like they're saved because they're not living in a close relationship with a God who saved them. And so I really believe that this is talking about the assurance of salvation. As you build this Christian life, you'll have the second thing is confidence. You'll have a confidence in your life that you are a child of God. His spirit will bear witness with your spirit that you are the child of God. The chapter of Romans says that. And so we'll have that confidence in our life, that assurance that we know that we're his. And at least... From this verse, we can see that if you lack these things, this person who lacks these things is someone who's acting like they haven't been purged from their old sin. They're acting like this big deal that happened to them at the moment of salvation is not really a big deal at all. Because they're, they're just the same thing they used to be. I got saved when I was 11, so I really was, and I was in church all my life, and so there really wasn't a huge change in my habits well, there's a huge change inside me. It made a big difference. And if we have something that big that happens to us, when the, the God of the universe moves inside of you, that's going to change things. And here, this guy who doesn't have, they, they haven't, they may have trusted Christ as their Savior. And it sounds like in this passage they have. He's talking to people who have been saved, but they haven't rolled their sleeves up and got busy working on a Christian life. They're really acting like that's not a big deal. They have forgotten how big a deal it is to get purged from all your sin, to have all your sins forgiven, to be on your way to heaven. It's not that big a deal. But those who have those things would have a confidence that we are the children of God. Look at the next verse. Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, ye shall never fall. Third thing, a good benefit from just living that kind of life, stability. Stability. You will be stable in your purpose and direction. Your calling and election will be sure. You'll have a purpose. You'll have a direction. Those things will be clear to you. You won't be in and out, wishy-washy, up and down, because you have accepted Jesus Christ by faith, he's implanted his divine nature. He's given you all things pertaining to life to godliness. And now, on top of that, you've worked on the, the characteristics in, in that relationship with him. And you're growing and you're maturing. And now you have stability. You're not in and out of church. You're not up and down. Emotions come and go, but you're solid. You're stable. You have made your calling and your election sure. If you do these things, you'll have stability. Hey, folks, you may not always know where, when, and how, but you'll always know what to do. Sometimes we struggle about where, when, and how. Where should I go? How should, how's this all going to work out? But we all know what we ought to do. You know, the purpose of, and I've kind of taken this as my phrase, to be a disciple and make disciples. And I could do that in Africa as a missionary. I could do that in St. Thomas as a youth pastor. I could do that in St. Thomas as a factory worker. That's what I'm supposed to do. Where, when, how, all those things. We, there are times of confusion in all of life of, of, of when should I move, should I stay, what's the next step for me. Those things will clear themselves eventually, but if you are... In the word of God, trying to grow, adding to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, you'll have that stability of this is, I'm not sure where 
or when or how, but this is what I'm supposed to do. I'm so sure of this. This is my calling. This is my election. This is who I am. I'm a child of God. I'm supposed to be like Jesus Christ. I'm a follower of Jesus Christ first. Everything else will take care of itself after that. That makes you, that gives stability in your life. And it says that here, ye shall never fall. That word fall means to slip far from God. I mean, we all have times of ups and, and, and kind of get away from the Lord. But if you work on these things and, and stay into the word of God, you won't have that time of apostasy where you get away from the Lord. You won't have that. You shall never fall. That word fall doesn't mean just to slip and mess up. We all mess up. It means to get away from the Lord. Last thing here. Verse number 11. If you have these things in your life, verse number 11. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You don't just slip into heaven. This is a glorious, abundant entrance into eternal life. If you're saved, you'll make it to heaven. If you're saved and you build a Christian life and you are faithful to God over the course of all your life, your entrance into heaven, same heaven anybody else would go to, other than yours will just be, says there, it's an abundant entrance into the kingdom. There's, there's no doubt. You're a no-doubter Christian. I mean, home runs that slip over the wall are home runs. Home runs that pop out of the glove and go over the wall are a home run. But a home run that is just crushed out of there, that's a no-doubter. And there are many people in heaven who got saved and didn't really build much of a Christian life, but they'll still go to heaven. But the Bible says if you do these things, your entrance into heaven will be abundant. It will be overflowing. It will be a glorious entrance. At salvation, God built you for spiritual success. It's anticipated and it's attainable. You should. That's what God expects of us. That's what God wants for us is a successful Christian walk. We need to commit to building our Christian life and be eager to increase. That's our part. As we grow, we'll reap the benefits of being a no doubt or Christian. Let me close with this. A no doubt or Christian. What do you get? Fruitfulness. Fruitfulness is outward. I didn't give you the last point, did I? I'm sorry. I just see that. Last point is glory. All right. Letter D, glory. Thanks, Robin. All right. Letter D is glory. You'll have a glorious entrance into heaven. Okay. Sorry about that. Let me make this point. We'll be done. Fruitfulness. Others will see. There'll be no doubt. And not that we, we don't live our life for others. We live our life for Jesus Christ. But one of the benefits of living this lifestyle is that there's no doubt. Because the life matches the lips. And what you say and who you are are the same thing. And there's no doubt. There's no doubt that person's a Christian. I have worked with youth for 25 years. So there are many young people that we have seen saved in our, in our youth group over the years. And I think, I hope that they're saved. I just don't see the evidence right now. Oh, they seem sincere when they got saved. And I remember their prayer. And I remember praying with them. And I remember the, the change that we saw right away. And Brother A's worked a long time in that class. And, and Brother Brian, we've seen a lot of those uh, people uh, you know, get saved. And think, we see a big difference. And they think, huh, I wonder if they're really saved. But if you have these things in your life and abound, it's no doubt that person is a follower of Jesus Christ. Faithfulness makes you a no, uh, fruitfulness makes you a no doubter Christian. Confidence. Not only is there no doubt in anybody else's mind, there's no doubt in your mind. I have no doubt I'm a child of God because I'm living in close relationship with God. And so this confidence makes a secure fellowship with, relationship with the Father. And there's no doubt in your mind. And stability. There's no doubt about your purpose. There's no doubt about your direction. You may not know all the details right now, but you know who you are and what God wants for you. And you're heading that direction. That gives you that stability in your life. And then someday we enter glory as a no-doubter, abundantly entering the eternal kingdom, the Bible says here. Not by our own works of righteousness, because of his righteousness, we, have, we follow the process of the Christian life. And so if I could conclude this whole thing with this for you to, to think about this week, the process of the Christian life is continual growth. Continual growth. That's it. A life that continues to grow. We looked at the first part here of 2 Peter. I put on the screen for you the very last verse of 2 Peter. 
Continues this theme. The Bible says this, but grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. It's continual growth. Second Peter starts out with Christian growth. Here's the process of Christian life. And it ends, but grow in grace. But grow in grace. Are you tonight stirred up to build a Christian life that produces fruitfulness, stability, confidence, glory. Whose glory? To him be glory. To him be glory, both now and forever. Amen. That's the process of a Christian life. Beginning through faith, growth through our eagerness to increase, and then God takes care of the benefits as we serve him and love him, be more like him. We trust you've enjoyed this message preached at the Bible Baptist Church of St. Thomas, Ontario, pastored by Dr. Al Stone. We invite you to be a part of our worship service this Sunday 